It's a few minutes after 11, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. I first want to thank everyone for joining today for our fifth webinar on Workplace of the Future. Welcome everyone to this innovation for what's next. I'm thrilled to be with you here today. I'm Kelly Kolar of Kolar Design and the Kolar Experience Institute. And I wanna welcome everyone to a super exciting panel discussion that we have today. Just to give everyone a little bit of background if this is the first time that you're visiting with us, the Kolar Experience Institute is designing workplaces of the future. And we have built an insight and research institute focused on exploring that intersection of people, process, and place. Of course, in creating that positive impact for all of our businesses, locally and globally. We triangulate the data and we actually measure that experience of place and the sentiments as it's connected to your business results. I'm thrilled today to have an amazing group of people to talk about the role of technology in innovating for what's next. Of course, thank you for attending. We, as always, will send out a recording I want to remind everyone that this is being recorded and please go ahead and um, put any questions you have along the way in the chat. We will also be sending you the recording as well as our gifts to you. Um, so we will have uh, obviously a white paper, again, downloadable from us on Workplace the Future, Remote Works Now What, What's the New Hybrid World Look Like, and How is Technology Playing a Role? We also have a free 30-minute consultation for those that may have questions about the webinar as well as about the Institute. And thankfully to ESI and Ed Sloshberg today for sharing with us a white paper on what the future holds in workplace. So that will also be downloadable. And lastly, we have Edson Kalkavan and his gift of the city that had two navels and his Biennale exhibition, where he used technology to cascade back and connect people globally to learn about the role of arts and culture in his, in his home country of the Philippines. So super excited to share those with you following the webinar today. But let's go ahead now and let's get started talking with our panelists. As I mentioned, um, I'm Kelly Kolar, president and founder of Kolar and the Kolar Experience Institute. We have an amazing panel today of thought leaders. We're doing a little bit of a different format if you've attended some of our past webinars. We're gonna be sharing um, aspects of and a Q&A, kind of an informational dialogue with our panelists. So I'm going to hand it off and um, let each one of them introduce themselves. But of course, our first speaker is going to be Serge Berlance, who's the head of workplace strategy here at Kolar and the Kolar Experience Institute. We have Edson Kalfaban from Tulane University and his role and the work that he does there. And I'm going to let him share a little bit about that. And then, of course, we also have Edwin Schlossberg, partner and an SCGD fellow in the design of ESI Design, an MBBJ studio. So super excited to have this thought leadership today as we explore what the future looks like. So let's start and let each of them tell a little bit about themselves and their background. So Edson, why don't we start with you? Thank you so much, Kelly, uh, for having me and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this uh, conversation. So hello everyone, um, I'm Edson Kobalfin. I am currently uh, associated with Tulane University, I am the uh, director for social innovation and social entrepreneurship program in the School of Architecture at Tulane. Uh, but I'm also concurrently serving as the newly appointed associate dean for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And one of the things that uh, Kelly also alluded earlier, which I will also talk about a little bit today, is that I was also the curator of the Philippine Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2018. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Edwin? Um, good morning, Edwin Schlossberg. I'm a uh, partner of ESI Design, which is a studio of NBBJ Architects uh, as of the beginning of 2020. So we've been part of NBBJ for a year. Um, and my background is that I studied uh, uh, physics and English and American literature. Uh, that's where I got my doctorate and, and my whole uh, career has been trying to use what I learned and understood about art and, and culture and uh, to transform experiences um, 
designing from the audience in rather than from the technology or from the content out. So um, I will talk about that. And I think that's one of the key ingredients that makes um, workplaces exciting is if the um, people work together uh, collaboratively to create new things. Fantastic. Thank you, Edwin. And Serge Dulance. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm Serge Dulance. I have a background in architecture, um, architectural sciences, and I'm currently completing uh, a master's in business innovation. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I'm a partner at uh, Colar Experience Institute, and I also lead workplace strategy at Colar Design. Um, and in our research, I'm focused on the intersection of uh, people, process, and place, and the effect, the positive effect that that can have for businesses and communities. Fantastic. Happy to be here. Thank you. Welcome to everyone. And thank you so much to each of you as panelists for coming on with us today and sharing your futuristic perspectives. So Serge, let's go ahead and start with you um, as the, the first part of the Q&A and the dialogue, and then Ed and, and Edson can chime in. But what are you, what is your kind of perspective? What global trends are you seeing now that are really impacting workplace? And what do we see that that future looks like? So please share kind of your perspective. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of studies and white papers uh, lately uh, that basically conclude that most people will um, want to, if, if their job permits, want to work in some sort of hybrid. And what's amazing is that, um, you know, 70% of uh, respondents in, in most global studies um, now rate the most important criteria for deciding where or for whom they want to work, that that's well-being and finding more of a... Uh, work-life balance uh, even more than uh, more important than compensation and salary so we'll see when things get back to normal whether that trend continues uh, it might also be uh, you know fueled a little bit by the uncertainty and and everything around the pandemic but uh, it's it's a quite uh, an amazing trend um, I think when the first shock of working remote and the lockdown sort of tapered off and people got used to and found a way of how it was to work remote, if they could do so in their job, um, people started to think about what matters most. Um, but with the available technology, uh, which is amazing uh, how things have, have moved. Uh, when I think about when I moved, in an overseas assignment uh, 15 years ago to Manila, um, the smartphone had not been invented. And yes, I could call back to Europe and, and uh, conference calls with the US and all of that sort of stuff, but it was expensive and a bit clunky. Um, today we take FaceTime for granted or Zoom and all of these technologies, which uh, have actually made this global experiment that we've all gone through the last, the last year possible and, and successful. And it's, um, you know, we, get, we probably can't imagine what technology we're going to have five, 10 years from now, but it's gonna be very different um, and much better. And so I do think that um, trying to find a balance between working in the office, face-to-face, -face, and having the social interaction that most people are craving, but, part of the time working remote at home or in another place, uh, finding that balance that that's a trend that's, that's going to, to continue. 25% uh, of people uh, say that they would want to work only in the office. And so the majority of people are looking for some sort of balance in a hybrid situation. So, so we'll see what that brings. Um, I think in terms of design response and what offices will look like in the future, that's going to drive a lot of change. Um, when you look at these bubbles here, the size of the bubble represents the importance of the trend uh, of a global study we did. Um, you know, people are looking at hybrid that obviously has a huge impact on, on their space, looking at either reducing space and reinvesting uh, from the savings in, in better technology for collaboration, 
as well as uh, supporting people in their work from home setup um, and looking, of course, at their work processes because uh, you can't look at those things in isolation. So uh, it's fascinating. Um, as we've talked about in the previous webinar, we're probably at the edge of uh, a paradigm shift. Uh, we're, we're just at the start, I think, of a lot of changes. And technology for sure is going to fuel um, and accelerate those changes in the next few years. Yeah, fantastic. You know, I think it's what's so interesting to me about that is, you know, I was on a, I was on a webinar yesterday with one of our clients, the Fifth Third Bank, and Valerie Garrett, the design director, said, you know, they're designing spaces with so much flexibility. You know, in the, in the, in the previous time, you would schedule off-sites and you would rent a place and go off-site with your team to do a deep dive for two or three days. Or, you know, even the Clay Street model at Procter & Gamble Stairs that you and I worked on, you know, doing design yep. deep dives internally for sometimes weeks at a time. Well, they're now, you know, businesses are now looking at on-sites. So how are you transforming your on-site experience? So because now that everyone's working in the third place, whatever that is, wherever, wherever you're working anywhere at any, any time, people are now looking at different ways to utilize the corporate asset and, and to schedule new experiences that way. So funny to see how the pendulum is swinging and, and how the role of real estate is going to change. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much. And moving into our next, our next kind of question, um, you know, really to, to, to Edson. I'd love Edson for you to talk a little bit about, Serge mentioned about technology changing our world. Obviously you've worked internationally and studied um, internationally and created international experiences as, as we all have. How do you see technology and design making a bigger impact in the world? You see a shift in the way that we're training our future of designers. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking, uh, and, and I think my point of departure is also from the experience as an educator. Uh, I've been a professor uh, for the last uh, 12 years, and, and I've uh, experienced uh, engaging with different uh, students and, prof and faculty across the world. And one of the things that has become very evident uh, in, in the last decade or so is uh, this understanding or, uh, or uh, focus also on looking at design uh, as uh, it impacts uh, society and the world in general. Um, you know, designers have had a, a uh, mindset of that we are uh, saviors of the world sometimes, and, and understandably so, you know, because of the long history of design education. Uh, but one of the things that um, has also become apparent um, and, and which has have been happening for, for, for so long is the idea also of how is it that then there are inequities that are happening uh, around the world. Um, and then especially with technology, we also begin to think about the impact in the world, but also like looking at uh, who has access to it and then who is able to participate in some of these technological advancements. And these are just some statistics which are a, a little bit outdated already, but just goes to show um, these were uh, statistical data uh, from the World Bank and, and the International Telecommunication Union um, who had uh, looked at, uh, for example, uh, the idea of who has internet access uh, back in 2018, you know, 51% of the world only has internet access. And if you break it down, for example, in 2019, the U.S. only about, eight, uh, still a, a sort of a majority, about 87%. But if you look at it and break it down in terms of income level, 86% um, of the world uh, has, of the high income earners have internet access. But on the other end of the spectrum, low income uh, in around the world, only 14% uh, has access. And if we go to the next slide, we can also begin to look at uh, how is it that then we're, we're thinking about then uh, the kind of changes that's happening with technology, but then also it also be, becomes even more apparent that there are inequities that are happening uh, and, and how this is not uh, necessarily the same or that then there, it's not necessarily a level playing field for everyone. Right. Uh, could, and so uh, especially uh, during COVID, uh, one of the things that also... Uh, and you've heard many stories and reports about this, uh, of, of again, the kind of uh, inequalities that's happening uh, has become so apparent. Um, and this is uh, also a report from UNICEF and the International Tele Telecommunication uh, Union just at the end of the year. 
and during COVID-19, um, they were uh, pointing out that uh, in the world, you know, 2.2 billion or two thirds of the children aged 25 years or less do not have internet access at home. Yeah. And so the, the pivot and the shift to uh, online learning has become also uh, unequal. That, uh, you know, there's a lot of these stories where um, our students, you know, um, I've, I've seen stories, for example, in the Philippines, you know, teachers would go up on the roofs so just to be able to have uh, access to uh, data so that they can teach. Um, and then some students do not even have either smartphones or tablets or laptops. And so uh, teachers had to go to them and physically, and that's also not just happening in the Philippines and it's happening also in the US and we see all of this. Um, and so that's the sort of um, uh, direction that we also need to think about in what are possible alternative models by which then uh, technology and education uh, as they intersect, uh, uh, what, what do we need to do? Um, so um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm, I was just looking at uh, one, an example here. Um, this is a, a group of um, a group of architects and planners in the Philippines. Uh, it's a women-led nonprofit called Tao Pilipinas, uh, who's based in Manila but uh, worked around the Philippines. Uh, and so it's uh, talking about and and their work is really about community engagement and how they're focused on equity-centered participatory design, where they let the stakeholders, the communities themselves, design their homes, their evacuation centers, their schools, and then they help build them. Um, and this is an idea that uh, I'm also working and I'm also pursuing uh, as currently as the Associate Dean for Equity, uh, Diversity, Inclusion, and kind of the issues that surrounded about uh, about how do we make our design and technology uh, equ uh, equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Uh, and to the next slide, um, also my work at the Philippine Pavilion, you know, as the curator uh, in the, at the 16th Venice Architecture Biennale, I also then began to look at and, and really think about then how can technology also be able to bridge and, and be able to sort of uh, communicate to a larger audience. And uh, this was the exhibition. Uh, that I also designed, and Tao Pilipinas, who I just talked earlier, uh, was in fact one of the groups that I also um, invited to uh, uh, work and also then uh, show their show their uh, work uh, through the pavilion uh, back in 2018. So again, um, thinking about how how we can begin to co-create the future, how do we begin to look at the, maybe technology uh, and education being uh, instruments of uh, empowerment. That's fantastic. I mean, that digital divide, those statistics are still staggering to me. And I think, you know, with the, with the murder of, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, it revealed so many also digital divide and inequities we have in our own country here. Exactly. And I know here, which is within our city in Cincinnati, you know, I'm, I'm very involved with the Cincinnati Park Board Foundation. Um, and, you know, we we're starting to bring internet access and activation to some of our kind of dark um, you know, shadowed parks and public spaces because we realized that, you know, the, the children were not even able to enjoy or even do their homework or connect in some of these really critical areas. So we have a lot of initiatives going on here in our region. Unfortunately, we have the third highest poverty rate here in the United States for children. So we have a lot of challenges here as a smaller kind of, you know, tier two city. Um, but I, 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 you know, I love that you have found ways already to digitally connect globally and how can something like this become an educational tool? That exactly. Um, so obviously we have a lot of work to do, but the role of technology in our businesses and our communities, you know, in, in our, com in our communities to live, work, play are becoming so critical. So before we open up the conversation, let's definitely hear from Ed. I would love to, let you share a little bit about the role that you see technology playing in designing these immersive experiences and, the, and what ESI has done really for decades. Um, so would love to have you share a little bit about your perspective on where you see that. Thank you. Um, I think those, those points that Edson made are really, uh, really very, very important because I think that the, um, I think that um, what the pandemic uh, has shown to everyone and what the racial inequality that has shown to everyone is that the need is that, that even though we have uh, established the United States as a 
group, uh, a country of individuals and many other places where independence is important. It's interdependence that really will be the feature of the next period because we have to work at, at, at the team level. And one of the things that we have focused on because of this is, is moving into companies, the ability to see and demonstrate that teamwork is the thing that, the, um, that is the essential component of, uh, of, the, of the future. If you, uh, I mean, a very interesting statistic is that uh, it used to be in most science magazines, uh, the uh, discoverer or the researcher that came up with a new idea that was uh, fantastic was one person, sometimes two people working together. Now, if you look at Nature Magazine or Science or others, sometimes there's up to 100 people listed as the inventor of a project or of, of a new idea. Yeah. And um, the, the, uh, the world is now so complex that the, what we know about the world is so complex on all different levels of observation that we need teamwork that can see all these different things simultaneously and be able to compose. And I think one of the positive outcomes of COVID is the, the seeing how essential um, collaborative teamwork is in designing and creating things, that it is in a sense an essential component um, and that being with other people and being able to talk to them uh, and, and talk to them in front of everyone else so everyone is get gathering and, and um, um, solving a problem together are the tools. And so we have been thinking this way. Uh, this is not, um, this is just the, the you know, uh, um, uh, um, <laughs> one of the Wright brothers said when they were asked about why they wanted to fly was that they were, were um, they were, uh, they had the disease of believing that uh, human beings could fly. And I think we have the disease of thinking that human beings can only really effectively work if they work collaboratively in teams. And so all our designs are built around this idea of collective dis uh, discovery and, and input. So here's an example of a project we did in, uh, for eBay, where there was nowhere for the eBay employees to learn about exactly what eBay did and how it's what happened and how all its customers were being uh, were achieving things. So we built this touchscreen um, environment, which allowed you to see um, how many uh, uh, ping pong tables were being sold at, or traded uh, worldwide on eBay at that given moment. And then seeing how uh, uh, the complexity of the system needed to support it. It also allowed uh, people to see how many um, uh, different, you know, on Halloween, what was the most popular uh, uh, thing that people were buying. So the, some of these are trivial examples of something, but the, the, the critical piece was being able to see into the complex interdependent systems that people are now working for, and that we have to see them as, um, as a reflection of the way people work together to see them. So Maybe we can, um, I don't know that I wanna watch this. Uh, I think we can just move to the next one, uh, please. So this is another project that we did for uh, B, uh, PNC Bank. Uh, they, they, this is the, supposedly the greenest building. I don't know if it's been proved, but the greenest building in the world that was opened, I think two and a half, three years ago. No, now it's more, it's five years ago. So uh, time flies. So uh, at that point in time, the, the uh, um, uh, building information system, we used the building information of this, uh, 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 the building information system to get the database to show uh, how all the windows were being opened and closed in the building, how water was being used in the building, how many people were in any, on any floor, the heat in the building, um, and, and then in, instead of displaying it as a narrative, we displayed it as a uh, basically like a, 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 a huge uh, <coughs> LED uh, data visualization, which hung in the center of the building. And so, the, and then we also had a output to uh, tablets and, <coughs> and to the computers of the people in the building so that they, they and others could see 
um, the life of the building as a, as, a, as a piece of information. And I think that the more that we uh, uh, create data visualizations of how things are going and how it impacts all the members of an organization, the more effective people become because they understand it not from a single point narrative, but from a multi-point narrative. And that's another kind of um, design, uh, uh, design guidance that we always use, which is thinking about uh, telling stories from many different points of view so that the stories don't reflect only the impacts of one person or two people, but of the, 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 of, of the, group, the whole group. So if we just click on to the next project, not, not look at the film, let's click back past the film. So the third project was just something to show, which is we just did, we designed the lobbies and all the data and, and display for the entire Warner Media headquarters in New York. And um, as you can imagine, the data that they had of all the Warner Brothers movies and all the Warner TV shows and and all the games from Warner Games. So we, we needed to develop a back end that would allow anything to be seen everywhere. Um, and so that th in a way, the, what the, you were walking into is into any of these spaces is a place where you could both see the newest things that are going on, but also the oldest things that were going on. And we, um, we developed a, a sampling tool that sampled Twitter and all the um, online feeds to find out how current Warner projects were being seen around the world so that you would see if you were, had been working on a new movie, you could see all the different things that people were saying about it um, as a dynamic call up anywhere in the building. And then on the left hand side of the screen, we, we designed a six story LED sort of column that uh, played uh, movies or TV shows, but we didn't play it on a um, on an image. We played it by color, so yeah. that the color on the on the LED uh, uh, going down the back, uh, the uh, facing New York City um, basically played a um, a movie or a TV show that was going on now, but by the co the the dominant colors that were on the show. So. What we all these things are about are about designing as a team, but designing thinking of the the impact not on a single narrative of good and bad or um, achieving financial success or cultural success, but on all the factors that <coughs> a design um, uh, works, and then also trying to the uh, facilitate that the collaboration tools in the environment are, are uh, sort of uh, irritants as you walk through the building. So you're constantly barraged by of the variety of things that are happening rather than just thinking of an institution as a single point narrative that tells a linear story. So I think that, um, I mean, I'm very optimistic about uh, go people going back to offices because I think uh, we've all now learned how effective uh, Zooming is, but also how, how much we miss the, the collaborative uh, right. uh, responsibilities that it created and how effective we uh, can be. And our office was, uh, was phenomenal in its ability to um, develop and, and uh, get projects moving along, even though we weren't seeing each other and we we're never in the office together. So um, I think that we've learned, uh, of course, there's a huge downside of, 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 the, of COVID and that's not, the, I mean, it's catastrophic, but I think that the upside for humanity is, is the value of our life with other people and working together to make things together. Um, and um, so, so that's, and our, that's the way our office has been thinking about it. And, and when we think about the future, we think about, as you mentioned, um, Kelly, the idea of flexible space, the idea of, of, of fixed space is, is now, I think, very, very uh, uh, challenged <laughs> as it should be. And yeah. the idea of flexible space is what yeah. uh, it needs to be. Great, let's, let's just show this one video of the Warner 
media show sure. example because I think it's an example that really shows the power of incorporating technology into a space from that multi-perspective view and how that changes your experience every day because literally it's a show day every day you go in. So based upon, as a media company, obviously that's their role is to continually reflect what society is doing and seeing and needing as they create more and more content. So, I mean, how amazing that every day, every time you come off the elevator here, you're gonna see something different, right? And I just love the, the sense of the pulse and the connectivity. So people are feeling very interconnected at the same time that it's also reflecting what's going on, right? Whether it's an election, or you know some catastrophic event, you know like the snowstorm or you know a hurricane in the Philippines, right? I mean they're able to really this is able to really connect in and represent that multi-perspective view that you talked about. Right. But that's a, it's a really really great example of how space and the digital physical are working together and connected together. So if anyone gets a chance to get to New York, this is definitely something to be seen. I know you take uh, that, you, you at your firm as well as I know, um, they take, uh, you know, media, the media company takes a lot of our University of Cincinnati students and DAP co-ops, which is so great. So a lot of our, a lot of our emerging talent um, that's coming up has an opportunity to collaborate and work in some of these spaces with you and your team. So love that multi-point perspective as well as the collaboration because, you know, we know decisions in corporations, back to your point about the science, Decisions in corporations now are made not just by one person. I mean, even decisions being made in a corporation are being made as an average at least by eight people. So think of that. Decisions are being made more democ democratically within business as well today. So business is changing faster than ever, for sure. Um, so we're definitely seeing that evolve. And I think you focusing on the audience um, with that multi-perspective view to create engaged and enhancement experience and then also use it as a teaching tool is is really really super super um, unique and definitely more what the future needs right definitely great so let's go ahead and let's let's open up the discussion um, now um, you know I'd love to hear from each of you about you know, and of course, Ryan, remind people on our on our panel, we're up 75 people here, so to please put any questions you have for our thought leaders about what they're seeing in the future of work and the role of technology, please put your questions in the chat because we wanted to allow there to be a good amount of time um, today in our remaining, um, you know, 15 minutes here to be able to have a good conversation and answer your questions about what do you see from these experts. So now back to our first question, you know, it's 2030, you know, what do you think our work, our live and our play experiences are going to look like now, 10 years out? Um, so I guess Edson, I'll, I'll circle back to you first. Um, and, and, you know, you're designing the future all the time. Who better to design the future than the students that will be the designers of tomorrow? So tell us, what are you seeing there? And what are you seeing as a, as a change? Thanks, Kelly. Um, I think that one of the biggest shifts that's happening right now, especially as we're educating uh, the future of designers, is that uh, designers now just do not need to be good at uh, being able to come up with solutions uh, or ideas and innovation, but also about the ability for them to empathize and the ability for them to be able to understand uh, the larger complex system. So it's, it's no longer this very siloed perspective. And I also like what uh, Ed was mentioning earlier um, about uh, collaboration, because that's also where I think uh, education and therefore as we kind of like live, work and, and play in the future is that thinking about the relational quality and the relational aspect of design and, and how is it that we're able to engage with others? How is it that we are able to co-create? Uh, how we are able to think about uh, uh, the kind of impact that we do? And so I'm seeing also this uh, uh, bigger uh, um, emphasis also on understanding uh, social value and, and the impact of what we design and what we create uh, in society at large. Um, and so I, I see that then as we're educating the future designers uh, and future leaders, uh, we're also seeing then how, um, how then the future 
will then uh, have even greater emphasis, I think, on social responsibility and civic engagement. Um, and, and something that is uh, uh, already happening now, but I see that it's, it's going to intensify and, and in fact maybe uh, become uh, an, uh, an urgent issue and an important uh, focus for, for a lot of students, uh, faculty, um, academicians, and then also, of course, the profession and then in the industry and then society at large. Edson, don't you think that the ability to listen to the, to the students, to, in a sense, instead of it be center to edge communication, that it's edge to edge communication, that the, I think our students and our junior designers and our junior, uh, juniors and everywhere need to be, uh, because I think they're more in touch with the empathy, uh, the empathy and the, the collaboration ethic. Uh, and we need to stop trying to do top-down organizations. Uh, we need to do much more uh, flat organizations in order to facilitate that conversation. Yes, exactly, Ed. I agree with what you're saying. Um, for example, you know, like learning skills to communicate with stakeholders. Um, and, and not necessarily, as you said, uh, uh, maybe necessarily a top-down decision. Uh, because like, if you're designing for a community, uh, it, it'll be good to listen to the community rather than assuming what they need. And, and, uh, and, and you're right, you know, I think that's, uh, that will be an important uh, skill and also an, an attitude uh, shift, I think, that needs to happen. Yes. That's great. Thank you so much. Hey, the, the questions are flooding in here now in the, in the chat. So let's, let's take the first one here. I'll start to field these and I'll, I'll pass them over to each of you. Um, the, the first one is, um, I guess, Ed, I'm gonna pass this one to, to you. How do you see people connecting better from working from home as well as those coming into the office? What do you see kind of as that paradigm shift as people create this new hybrid model? That's from Catherine Thomas. I think that the issue is that, that the, the, the time between conversations have, have to um, shorten. Um, that we need to, you know, in our office, I would say five years ago, we would be working on a design and we would meet about it once a week. And I think now we have to meet every other day, I th and especially, um, especially during the pandemic because, because everyone has all these moments in their head when they're working on the solutions and they they so they they do a lot more focused work alone and that has to be dumped into the 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 pile of everybody else's much faster so i think that we can't we have to actually accelerate the um the production the design and production time i'm sure that the clients won't uh, object to that um but i think it's also an important thing to do i mean it used to be that we had you know, that th that worked, but I think now time is uh, very different. So we need much more, that's, that's the way we're working now, faster and much less, uh, much less uh, uh, reflection and much more active uh, engagement. Yeah, so activation. Yeah, great, great, great answer. Okay, let's go to the next question. This one's for you, Serge, um, coming up. It's saying, you know, what are the keys to transforming this successful hoteling type structure? in this new hybrid environment. I mean, obviously your 30 years at Procter & Gamble, um, you know, building, hoteling, I mean, p g was way ahead on the remote work anywhere. So your work and your life can balance and you yourself have lived and worked in, you know, in, in, you know, dozens of countries. So tell us a little bit, what do you see the future hoteling structure looking like? Well, I think um, the most important, the most important thing is that the culture, the cultural climate um, has to be set up for an environment where you basically trust the employee to do their best and choose the venue and it could be changing throughout the day, um, you know, what works for them better, right? I mean, at PNG, you're right, um, we realized, I think um, this goes back at least 25 years ago, um, that a one size fits all sort of a standard we had or we were going to 
that that really doesn't work very well. And in my role as global architect at PNG, I, I, you know, everywhere I went, people were immediately telling me, well, you have to understand in, in this culture, in this country, the global standard doesn't work. So what can we do? So, um, so first of all, the, the culture, the climate, uh, having that, uh, that trust, if that isn't there, whatever design is going to fail. Um, and then the, the variety of types of, of spaces and you know, whether it's desks or, or whatever furniture that goes with it, um, ranging from quiet for more focused work uh, with the right technology set up to uh, spaces that are really set up for more uh, noisy, more collaborative uh, work. Uh, also looking at separating those so that one doesn't impact the other. Um, you know, so it, the devil is really in the details, um, but it starts with understanding for each company uh, or, uh, you know, even within a company, um, a business unit or whatever, or location, what is that cultural climate? What works for them? And then tailor it to those needs and not take something from a magazine that looks cool um, because chances are that that might fail. And there is a change, usually there's a cultural change management component associated with uh, uh, making a big change going from one environment that to another that is dramatically different. Right, fantastic. I mean, I think that goes back to Ed's point about the, the community that you're serving and being empathy-based and understanding the audience's experience, whether it's your employee, um, or it's a customer experience, or it's you know an Edson's an Edson situation, an entire community. If you're doing social impact design, you know it's about about that end user's experience and how are they how are they involved in in choosing what the right hoteling experience is. But there definitely is not one size fits all. So love that cultural transformation piece that you added. Um, Ed, what about what are your thoughts around that and this kind of hybrid remote thing and the hoteling? What are you seeing? What I love about the, the PNC example um, that you showed, and maybe Brianna can pull the video back up and we can just play that in the background for the audience. But what's so interesting to me about that is, first of all, this lead and green building and the, the position that PNC wanted to make in downtown Pittsburgh, which, by the way, I've been to that headquarters, is fantastic. And PNC is a big player here as well in the Midwest market in Cincinnati. But you know, they wanted to make a statement as a company about their brand to the community and they wanted to make sure that this building stood as a symbol. And so the fact that you actually invited the inhabitants to actually understand what the building design is for and what it's doing longitudinally over time. Um, I mean, that's a whole new way of engagement, right? Inviting people to play and to be a part. Right. But so, I think, yeah. yeah so I think that what, uh, you know, one of the things I said at a, at a meeting when I was sort of describing this is that um, I often have the best conversations and the most interesting um, discussions walking around um, with people. And uh, I know that that's true. I mean, I know that people, if you, if you take a walk with someone, you know, very often that's a very great thing to do. And, so the interesting thing is you don't have to design that. Um, uh, so I, the, the thing that I like is, uh, as I said, I, I think that design, you know, and Gertrude Stein said that all great art is irritation. Um, I think that the design that we produce uh, in, in especially in corporate environments needs to be irritation. It needs to be irritating by telling you more about what's going on in the company, more about um, how the company works, you know, how many processing moments are going on, there. you know, that it, the more that you can absorb about the company just by walking through it, the, rather than thinking that the, the, the wood on the wall or the carpet really communicates a, 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 a something, I, I think that that makes a huge difference because it, in effect, it, it, it gives a, a sense of trust and the idea that 
uh, two people can be listening to the same thing and perhaps getting a different outcome from it. And that's interesting for them to hear that. So I think that making the environments much more challenging, much more dynamic, much more irrita irritating is really uh, a key ingredient of what I think both the work and the public environments need to be. Great, love it. Thank you so much. And I, 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 this immersive experience concept and the engagement strategy and our environment becoming more responsive to us is, is you know, really, really exciting to think about the role um, that the built environment plays in creating that intersection of that digital and physical. So fantastic. Now, okay, we have like 10 more questions in the chat, so I want to make sure we get to those. Um, love, uh, I want to, this one is coming from Steve Dohler, one of our outstanding faculty from University of Cincinnati. Steve, thank you for joining. Uh, I see you're bringing up this well-being concern about the office and the sitting and the lack of standing and how we're now spending 12 hours on these Zoom calls where before, back to Ed's point, you know, we're, we're interacting, we're mingling, we're moving, you know, we're all getting our 10,000 steps on our Fitbits, connecting with our people. What do you see as the well-being change that needs to happen? So as we, right now, we're kind of stuck. We're like with these, you know, with our laptops and our screens. What do you see as the future? So who wants to, who wants to tackle that one about well-being and health in the, in the built environment and in the office experience? I can say something about that. I think um, we're still, I think, somewhat stuck in, in old thinking in that everything is binary, meaning we're on or off work. We are in the office or, or not in the office. We're at home as if there are no other choices. And I think uh, this is why I call it remote work and no longer work from home. Um, we already had before the pandemic 12% in the US of workforce of um, knowledge workers working in a, in a WeWork type setting. Um, and, and that trend will continue as well. Um, funny enough, a lot of them have invested into more and better collaborative spaces that a lot of employers didn't invest in. And so employees are saying we like that type of environment. And I think um, we're going to continue to see much more fluidity um, in, and the workplace is no longer going to be, be the office or home. It's going to be a variety of things. People will have more choice and the technology will, will continue to develop. And um, I don't think that, you know, you then necessarily will have to have a laptop and tie to a desk and sit all day. Uh, I, for one, most of the time I'm actually walking around and I'm using um, my, uh, my phone to connect. Uh, now, that doesn't work for everybody. It also depends on what you're doing. But uh, like Ed, I, I've also always felt that when you're walking around, you know, the thought processes and you're conversing with people is just different. So I think it's going to be much more fluid um, and, and better for us to choose and not to spend the whole day uh, sitting behind a desk in the same way. Fantastic, thank you so much. Yeah, I'd like, I, I, I'd like to add, Kelly, um, I'd like to add also that I think like one of the things that uh, we've also seen with COVID is that, um, that the relationship between indoors and outdoors have become also very critical um, that uh, it's, it's well-being about having also a balance and also having the ability to be able to connect, let's say, with the outdoors. Uh, that's one key uh, insight that has also been emerging. Um, and, and I think part of the change that needs to happen also with the built environment is that, for example, cities need to be really be redesigned then to have this connection with nature or connection with outdoor spaces. And so how do you do that, right? Like how do you then reconfigure this connection so that then people who are, um, and, I, and I agree with like what Serge was saying about uh, uh, this fluidity that you don't need to just be in one place at all, the, all day, but rather have the ability to move around uh, spaces and the outdoors, I think, is also then going to be critical uh, component of that. And so how do you then 
incorporate uh, the outdoors uh, as it relates also to the indoors. Uh, there was a study, you know, back in 2001 by UC Berkeley and uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and and you know they they uh, said in the study that uh, the average American then in 2001 was spending 93 percent of their time indoors. Ooh. This was 2001. Uh, so um, there hasn't been a new study done, and I'm curious curious like wh- how how uh, how it has shifted. But I think the pandemic has made it really apparent that then uh, you know people need to go outside. Um, and, and I know, granted, that uh, it maybe it's not possible for other places because it's colder, but then how do you begin to redesign uh, those spaces so that then when you're working, um, you're able to shift in and out um, depending on um, what you need and what you want during the day? Yeah, I mean, just like the, whether it's this pandemic or the next one, just like all the outdoor dining, but right before the webinar, Ed and I were talking about New York and just all of our cities and all of our restaurants, how we need to help our retailers get back on track. And they're all creating these outdoor spaces. So right. you know, that's just, I know they're more pop-up shop and we're seeing a kind of restaurant labs and we're seeing a lot of innovation in trying to help our retail and restaurant small businesses, small minority and women-owned businesses get back on track with these pop-up shops. But your point about office space being a new design trend having that access to outdoors, I think is something that's going to be really, really critical as a quality of well-being exactly. uh, as well as of, of productivity, right? We need our, we, we did a webinar two times ago on the, literally the correlation of the data, healthier employees create healthier and more successful companies. Right. So there is a direct correlation to that. And obviously space is a critical component of that. So I wanna, uh, we've, got a, we've got another couple of floods of questions in here in the chat and we have only a few more minutes. So I wanna make sure we get to those. Um, Edson, the, the first one here is, I'm gonna direct to you, Mackenzie um, Goyert, one of your past students at University of Cincinnati. Your question to all of the panelists, so this is really for everyone, but we'll, we'll let Edson start out. How can young designers, you know, within their firm or their project teams kind of kickstart the shift? to more empathetic and understanding the approach and the new way of design solution approach. I mean, Ed, obviously your company is leading the way in this. Edson, you're teaching that to the designers coming out of school, but it sounds like there may be a gap in the management of of some of the, the rest of the design industry. So how do we encourage our young people to embrace this as well as to become really reverse mentors for the future? of a more empathy-based design approach overall. Do you have thoughts on that, Edson? Yes, thank you, Mackenzie. Nice to hear from you, uh, as a, you know, um, having you as a former student. Um, I'm thinking that as junior designers and actually anybody also within their firms, I think you need to start that and initiate that uh, step. Um, if the management, for example, is not necessarily including that uh, effort in in sort of their day to day operations or even in the in the kind of the ethos of the company, then I think you can demand it, you know, um, or 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 ask your your boss, ask your mentor, you know, and and to to have a conversation and then to start uh, maybe doing projects that uh, would require you, uh, and and also then to be able to practice a more empathetic approach. Um, Somebody needs to start it, and I think um, I, I would encourage you to to start that conversation if if that's not happening already, um, so that then you encourage uh, sort of like a broader maybe shift also within the company, or find, would... or find another company, or start, <laughs> or start your own company, the, the entrepreneur. Exactly. I think, I, I think Ed Schlossberg and I would say, just start your own company. If that's if that's what you're missing, then that's find a, a gap, way. right? That's but a gap. That's uh, exactly. Mm-hmm. I want to pivot one more question um, back to uh, to Sarah. There's two specific questions about workplace strategy here. Um, is there an occupancy and space management tool that you recommend for planning and managing office space use in the new hybrid model? And how can we begin to start to calculate that on a daily basis? And then that piggybacks on the next one, which is how can they measure and start to monitor the impact and the well-being aspect related to that. So what tools and training and technology do you recommend um, that people begin to look at and utilize? It starts with, I'm not aware of uh, a specific uh, 
technology tool that's on the market to to calculate occupancy in a in a hybrid model but um and i would be a little bit careful using some of those pre-cooked maybe solutions it starts with understanding um the work processes and patterns of the people um it's not only what they think but you know how do they spend their day um and and therefore what are the needs that will inform the uh the variety of what you need to have in terms of um collaboration spaces casual formal um you know desking solutions whatever um it starts from understanding uh through survey uh and and other tools that are available we do those as well um you know what are the work processes and how do you design for that and then how do you build in flexibility because once you get onto a journey and go away from you know one to one assigned desks to shared to you know allowing people to choose where they work including remote um it becomes a journey and change will continue so it's definitely very important to build in flexibility fantastic serge thank you so much for describing that journey of transforming your culture the cultural transformation of your workplace and how you do that. The final question here is, I'm gonna leave it with Ed, which is they're asking about touchless technology and the future of tech. Do you see technology continuing to play a major role in, in everything we do? Um, <clears throat> if it doesn't, uh, we'll be back in the stone age very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, remember that there are 220,000 more people on earth every day net increase. So technology is the nervous system, not exactly the right metaphor for enabling that number of people to be connected with and fed and housed and clothed. So the idea that this technology is going away is a fantasy. Um, the technology becomes a networked and a, uh, a varied uh, level of networking like the world is, uh, is, is, is coming very fast. And I think the uh, speed at which the, the next several generations of technology are gonna happen, they're gonna be within the next five years. Yeah. And a lot of the things that we are doing now have to be anticipating um, adjustments to that speed level of change because that has to happen. Um, if we get into a situation of of uh, Neanderthal control, um, that will stop it. And that wouldn't be a nice thing to happen. So I think um, the idea of technology is always the idea of what it's good for and what, it, and what it's good for is it uh, accelerates the ability to talk and exchange from, learn from, be sensitive to other people which is what we're all about. So I think um, it's not a goal in and of itself. Great, Ed, that's such a great way to think of the nervous system and the ecosystem and the transformation. We're gonna see an explosion, I think, in the future. It's right o'clock right now here, it's 12.01, so I promise to keep us on time and on track. I know we started a few minutes behind. I wanna thank again this amazing panelist group for the thought leadership as well as the gifts that you've shared. The link to this and the recording of the webinar will be sent out to everyone along with the opportunity for you to do a consultation. If you have more questions for Serge about hoteling and workplace, sign up for one of the free 30 minute connections with him. He can talk to you in more detail about that. Edson, thank you for your paper on the Biennale and how you created a cascading experience from country, from your country and your countrymen to the remote parts of your country, directly to the Venice Biennale and the transformation. And Ed Schlossberg, our fellow from SCGD, thank you so much for sharing your vision, your passion and the legacy that you've created with your firm and the transformational projects. I'm excited to see everyone again. We hope to see you next time. We have an amazing talk on how to win talent retention and traction. So how to keep your people happy in the remote and the new paradigm shift. We'll be doing that on Thursday, March 25th. Thanks so much everyone for attending. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>